um, welcome to the um, fifth lecture on the on your course VSLA that is vector space linear algebra. Um, I guess we are recording. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, as uh, promised, you know we 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 wanted to cover some problems from the uh, from the book Hoffman Kunze. So we'll uh, do that today. Uh, and we have covered a lot of uh, ground on theory. So we'll we'll go back to the uh, idea of subspaces and, and, and then you know cover some problems and try to drive home the point of um, you know how to understand whether a subspace exists and stuff like that right um, so some uh, recap on, on subspaces was that uh, one very important thing was that you know we we, we, we want to understand uh, how do you uh, know if a given subset is a subspace of, of a vector space or not we have a theorem which tells us that a non-empty subset uh, w of v is a subspace if and only if uh, if I take any two vectors from that subset, then I get uh, the, the, the scalar multiplication with any uh, scalar in the field and the vector addition of any two vectors should belong to that particular subset, right? That is the uh, uh, idea of a, a vector uh, subspace. Uh, and then we then saw some examples of, you know, uh, what, what could be possible subspaces, what, what is not a subspace. For example, this example, which which seems like a subspace, but, but isn't exactly a subspace. Uh, we, we also saw uh, the uh, null space of a matrix as an example of a uh, subspace of the uh, vectors uh, of the vectors, which come as a product of uh, your, uh, uh, you know, uh, which are product compatible with the matrix uh, given here, right? Um, and then we, we, we proved some uh, basic theorems about subspaces. I, 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 and I mean, then came to uh, an idea of you know what is the subspace spanned by a non-empty subset of a vector space which is basically just the linear combination of vectors in s now that became important when we moved to the idea of basis and dimensions and linear transformations and stuff like that okay so today we'll look at some problems of the in this idea of subspaces um okay uh, so these are some some problems from the hoffman kunze book um, the first one we are trying to see is um, let's say we have a um, you know uh, 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 v is a, a real vector space of all functions f from r to r right so the functions of f are from r to r so we are saying which of the following sets of functions are subspaces of v right so v is set of all these functions um, right all such functions which are uh, you know from r to r uh, so which of the following uh, uh, you know uh, sets of functions are subspaces of v so the first uh, here question is um, where we look at i have a f, f of x square is equal to f of x the whole square right now to understand this particular thing what we need is we need two operations defined on the vector space right so to as a recap uh, the the um, uh, addition operation on this um, uh, vector space that, that's a case of all functions is defined like this right uh, let's say we have f and g are two functions in this um, vector space the addition uh, 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 vector space is is defined as uh, the sum of two functions their pro their sum sum at the respective points, and the product is defined like this, right? C times f of x, right? Um, all right. Uh, so, so so here uh, this this uh, we're missing this real vector space, right? So what is real vector space? So basically the the, the field over which it is defined is over the field of real numbers. So here this C is basically a real number, right? It belongs to. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, yeah so first things first uh, we'll see uh, so so in case any one property also fails then uh, it's uh, you know uh, failure so so, 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 so so to prove that if this particular sort of a set right so let's say uh, the better way of writing this could be when I have so let's say w is a is a set of all functions f such that f of x square is equal to f of x the whole square and such that f is from r to r right uh, so what we need to prove is um, uh, if c is any uh, scalar then c f plus g function right defined in this format c times f of x plus g of x right if this also belongs to w then we say that it's a subspace so 
now uh, we look at uh, so so if this function has to belong to w uh, then it it, it is this is such such with this condition right so we'll look at the um, um, x square uh, of this particular function this becomes c times f of x square plus g of x square now this f of x square is equal to f of x the whole square by definition right, right? because f and g belongs to this particular sub, uh, subset this becomes f of x square um, yeah we'll add it like this and plus g of x square right which in no way is uh, c times f of g of x squared right because this is equal to cf of g uh, sorry this is equal to cf plus cf of x plus g of x the whole square and this is cx squared f of x squared plus g of x squared plus 2 times c f of x g of x right so which is uh, not uh, equal to this one so hence this is not a subspace right uh, moving to the next uh, question all f such that so we are considering now a subset such that f of 0 is f of 1 where f is again from r to r um, so same idea we'll uh, look at cf of cf plus g of 0 what would this be this is just basically cf of 0 plus g of 0 by definition this is equal to cf of 1 plus g of 1 because f and g are elements of this f this is equal to cf plus g of 1 right so cf plus g as a function also belongs to w hence this will be a subspace right so this is a subspace um okay, problem three um all f such that f of three is equal to one plus so f of three is equal to one plus f of minus five where f goes from r to r right okay so same idea we'll look at c f of c f plus g of three right because we we want to see whether this is equal to uh, this function value or not this becomes cf of 3 plus g of 3 this is equal to c times f. this is 1 plus f of minus 5 right g of 3 is g, uh, 1 plus f of minus sorry g of minus 5 right now addition is uh, uh, associative on, on, on real number field so we'll get um, like this right now this is not equal to uh, what you would ideally want it you would you would have wanted it to be 1 plus c times f cf plus g of minus 5 right which it clearly isn't right uh, because this turns out to be just uh, c plus 1 plus um, yeah cf plus g times of minus pi right so this c is extra and therefore i mean it's not uh, a subspace right. all f such that f of minus one is zero um let's look at this mm, yeah so w is all f such that f of minus one is zero right f goes from r to r so we need to now look at cf plus g of minus 1 this is cf of minus 1 plus g of minus 1 this is equal to c times 0 f of minus 1 is 0 g of minus 1 also 0 because the elements of this uh, set w and this becomes 0 so therefore this function cf plus g also belongs to w and therefore it is a subspace right now all f which are continuous now this is a bit uh, different from the way we have solved till now so let's say f says that sorry um, yeah f says that f is continuous continuous on which space on f going from r to r 
right? We're not talking about vector value functions. We're talking about real real domain functions, right? So, what what does f f um, continuous mean in this domain? So basically, that we are saying that limit extends to a f of x equals f of a, right? For all f belonging to W, and by definition of continuous functions. So now we want to look at whether if I define a function which is cf uh, limit extends to a cf of g of x, right? This is the function that I'm I'm, 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 I'm trying to look at. How does it behave at point a? Now this is for all a also, by the way, right? For all a belonging to R, right? Now uh, this uh, will be equal to, um, so we'll, we'll apply, we'll expand this function definition, right? This becomes c f of x plus g of x. Now limits can be broken in, in addition. So I'll get, this becomes c times limit extends to a f of x, limit extends to a g of x, right? And then, um, yeah, this becomes C times F of A plus G of A, which is basically C F plus G of A, right? So this function C F plus G is continuous at A, right? And this is true for all A, right? Because this holds for all A. So for all A, this is uh, true. And therefore, C F plus G is, is also continuous, right? Is continuous. And therefore, C F plus G belongs to them right so therefore uh, the uh, e uh, the fifth uh, set is also a, is a uh, subspace of the function set right function uh, set okay so th this is the way that you should ideally go about proving uh, such things we already looked at a similar example uh, when we were dealing with subspace in the second lecture second third lecture right uh, so for example where you looked at uh, null space how do you prove if if the null space is a of a matrix is a uh, subspace of the uh, vector space or not, right? Um, right, and so on. Uh, so, yeah. So that is uh, so. This is some idea uh, using the functions as an example. Now we'll look at uh, another uh, example where we deal with matrices as as your uh, this one, right? So, yeah. Okay. So. Uh, we're saying that f is a field and n will be a positive integer uh, such that n is more than or equal to 2, right? Um, v is a vector space of all n cross n matrices over f, right? Now we've already seen that uh, this is actually a vector space. So any uh, so any field you take, right? Any uh, uh, the 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 the, the uh, uh, vectors defined by this uh, uh, space f m cross n is a vector space, right? Is a vector space. Right. So now we're looking at which are the following sets of matrices A in V are subspaces of V. Right. So first thing, so uh, first thing we need to understand is okay, but that is n is greater than or equal to two. That's point number one. F is the field. Right. And we're looking at matrices which are of the uh, which are from I mean the, the vector spaces over I mean the vector spaces F M N cross N. Right. So we are we dealing with square matrices here. Right. Um, now. So, uh, what is all invertible A? What is all invertible A mean? That is basically your um, uh, so matrices which are which are all invertible. So therefore, um, A is here is um, yeah. Mm. One second. So all invertible. A, okay. Um, so first things first, we, we need the uh, we need the zero element to be a part of the subspace, right? Every subspace of a vector space should have the element zero in it. Uh, the, the 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 zero vector. Uh, here the zero vector is basically a square matrix of all entries zero, right? So um, the zero vector that is zero n cross n is not invertible, right? Is not invertible. Right. This implies that zero is does not belong to this subspace. Um, let me define it properly. So you have uh, W, which is basically set of all A, which belongs to F n cross n, is 
invertible right so zero does not belong to w and therefore uh, w is not a subspace okay is not a subspace okay so a is not uh, this one all non invertible a so w is a set of all matrices uh, belonging to f n cross n such that a is non invertible non invertible right um, yeah so if a so so <laughs> here very clearly zero belongs to this subspace right um, so zero n cross n is not invertible is not invertible uh, so therefore uh, zero belongs to this subspace which is which is fine uh, it's just a sanity check what we actually need to prove is that any matrix let's say for example a and b which belong to w right um, any uh, uh, combination c a plus b should also belong to w that's the question we're trying to ask right um, so we'll prove this by uh, uh, using an example and uh, showing that uh, if it doesn't hold for a for a single example, then it, then we, we can just prove that this is not true, right? By, by finding a by, by finding a counter example. So let's consider n is equal to two and c equal to one. Let's say c equal to one. Okay. So um, and I'll consider two matrices which are non-invertible, right? So I can consider such something like this. So a is one zero 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 and b is 0, 0, 0, 1, right? Both of these are non-invertible because their determinants is R0, right? Um, okay, so, um, um, yeah, this is, this is true. But now, if I were to uh, see this product, uh, see, see this, uh, see this uh, sum, so C times A plus B is basically A plus B, which is basically 1, 0, 0, 1. This is invertible, right? Because the, uh, uh, is invertible right and this is because the determinant of this turns out to be just one which is non zero right so therefore we found an example where, where this does not work and therefore we can say that b uh, w is not a subspace right so b also is not a subspace so which is uh, sort of um, you know good to see that you know the uh, negation of this particular statement all invertible a is also not a subspace and we, we saw that this is not a subspace anyway right um, okay then third uh, thing is that we're saying okay um, um, all a such that a b equal to b a where b is some fixed matrix in b okay so a b equals to b a so i'll define this as a set w b let's say um, all matrices a in this uh, space and f n cross n says that a b equals to b a right so okay so i'll consider uh, two matrices let's say c and d right which belongs to w b okay now we need to look at um, okay c and d can be a let's use x and y for now so x capital x capital y uh, are two matrices which, which belong to this particular set right uh, we need to look at c x plus y right does it belong to uh, wb or not right so c x plus y times b is what you need to look at right this should be equal to b times c x plus y if that is true then c x plus y belongs to this uh, particular set and therefore we are done okay so this is basically equal to c times x b plus y b right this is from the idea of uh, matrix multiplications oh, by the way here b is also a, a element of this vector space b right uh, i mean the, the vector space f m n cross m right so therefore this pro this 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 product this, this matrix uh, multiplication is, is well defined because it's a product of two n cross n matrices so so the, they are matrix matrix compatible multiplication compatible right so uh, this is from the idea of matrix multiplication now this can be written as c b x plus b y because x and y belong to w b right this can be written as b times cx plus b times y right cx is some matrix okay uh yeah the scale matrix and this can be written as b times cx plus y again from my idea of matrix multiplication so therefore cx plus y belongs to this set wb 
right so therefore i can say that uh, this third uh, set subset is, is, uh, is the space of this particular uh, vector space right uh, okay third uh, fourth thing is all a such that a square equals to a right so the third one so let's say w the subset is defined like this a elements of n cross n such that a square equals to a right so what we need to so let's uh, say i have a and b a some matrices in w right what i need to look at is c a plus b squared right let's see if this equals to c a c a plus b or not now this is equal to um c a plus b times c a plus b right so this becomes c squared a squared okay plus c a b plus c b a plus b squared right so this becomes c squared a because a squared is a plus c a b plus c b a plus b right um now this becomes um so it is equal to c a plus b is a question right so um uh -huh. so let's say i can take c a common here if that is the case i get c a no sorry c c i then right uh plus b because then becomes c squared a and this becomes c times a b right plus uh, i can take c b common uh i get a plus i right so there's i don't take common anymore here anyway so yeah so this is not equal to c a plus b anymore right um mm, mm, yeah c times a plus uh, i no so yeah so so it's not equal to c a plus b evidently so therefore this mate this matrix does not belong to w and therefore this is not a subspace right so uh yeah so so, so this is some way to you know solve these uh, set of problems uh, from the hoffman kunze book uh there are many more interesting uh, problems on the subspaces right um and uh, you know uh, feel free to try them out and post it on the um, uh, google group right in case you have any uh, doubts right okay uh, then we move on to this idea of basis and dimensions where we discussed uh, the idea of what is a basis and how do you define a dimension uh, of a, of a vector space right um uh, so we saw that you know uh, uh, any basis basically is a set of linearly independent set of vectors uh, of, of any vector space which spans a particular vector space uh, and the dimension of the vector space is basically the number of elements in that basis and we also went ahead and proved go, going forward saying that any two bases have the same number of elements so therefore the, the dimension of a vector space v is well defined it's it's one number across all of, across all possible bases that, that can exist right okay um then we also showed that uh, we, we, we saw some examples of this taylor series expansion where you know we saw that uh, what what is what it is actually doing is that it's uh, trying to expand uh, the any fu any function as a um uh, in this basis which is fk of x equal to x bar k right and we also saw the idea of you know uh, how would you uh, find a basis for a for for the for this vector space f m cross n which is basically a matrix of the order m cross n right and the the, the dimension of uh, of this uh, of this uh, vector space f f m cross n turned out to be m into n right okay um and then we we, we put a very important theorem which which helped us uh, prove some stuff in the uh, linear transformations uh, uh part of the lecture uh, where we said that if uh, the uh i have a vector space which is spanned by a finite set of vectors beta over to beta m then any independent set of vectors in v is going to be finite and contains no more than m elements right um again we went to this proof uh, last time uh, then uh, we had two corollaries which came out from there um and we did prove that um yeah and we saw this lemma which we said that in case i have a, a subset s which is linearly independent subset of a vector space and let's say beta is a vector in b which is not in the subspace spanned by s right then by adding this beta vector to the set s the the set s still remains linearly independent right so uh, in, in this way you, you can actually grow your uh, uh, subset starting from any any um, uh, individual vector to actually 
span the whole span the whole uh, vector space and therefore co construct a basis for for this uh, uh, for any vector space all right uh, and uh, it is uh, the idea is basically use it pca sort of an algorithm in uh, machine learning all right uh, fine so um, yeah uh, and uh, yeah this is all fine with these all the queries okay so we'll, we'll look at some problems of this in this uh, uh, in this idea um, so first thing is that yeah so Okay. Yeah. Uh, so problem number six here. So let D be a vector space of all two cross two matrices over the field F. Mm, prove that V has dimension four by exhibiting a basis for V which has four elements. Okay. Um, so we, we we already saw an example like this when proving that F M cross N is a be, uh, vector space and what could be the basis for that right so we're saying that v is a vector space over the field i mean uh, the it's, it's basically f m sorry f2 cross 2 right f2 cross 2 so basically any element of v let's say i'll call it as a is basically something like a b c and d right so my claim is that uh, the the basis uh, for this particular vector space right is um, yeah the basis let's say b okay is a1 a2 a3 a4 where a1 is defined as 1 0 0 0 0 0 and a4 is defined as 0 0 0 1 right now um, so to prove a basis the idea is that you need to prove first thing is linear independence and then prove spanning right so linear independence is uh, so so actually what we can do is we, we can see if i were to look at any linear combination of these vectors right uh, these matrices uh, here uh, over the same field f by the way so then what i have is i have c1 a1 plus c2 a2 plus c3 a3 plus c4 a4 okay turns out to be a matrix which is just like this right now if i were to uh, sorry if i were to equate this to zero what would happen right uh, um, let's say this is some uh, uh, matrix x let's say right so if x has to be zero it implies that all of these elements that is c1 c2 c3 and c4 are all zero right which implies that your set b is linearly independent right so we have proven the linear independence thing and let's say so any matrix a right can be can be uh, seen as a linear combination of these matrices uh, of, of these matrices by setting c1 equal to a c2 equal to b c3 equal to c and c4 equal to d right where a b c d are the elements of a so therefore uh, i mean this basis b spans the vector space uh, b right so therefore b is a basis right so this is one uh, this, this is one way of you know going about and proving this uh, now the seventh problem is um, yeah so let me be the vector space of exercise 6 fine uh, w1 be the set of matrices of the form like this and w2 are like this now prove that uh, w1 and w2 are subspaces of b okay um, so how would you prove a subspace of V is basically uh, you, you should say, say, say that uh, any uh, combination uh, let, let's say you have A and B as some matrices of the of that form right um, uh, Cx Ca plus B should belong to that same set right okay so first thing is we have W1 okay W1 is of the form um, yeah x minus x y z x minus x y z and w2 is um, a b minus x yeah okay so this is um two matrices uh, two uh, uh you know uh, uh, subsets of this one right so 
uh, the right way of uploading it is in bracket and everything okay we'll we'll skip that for now um so actually let me just do that so all um you know a belonging to f2 cross 2 such that a is of this form right and um, yeah, so all of this form where x y z are belonging to f right anyway you can write so you the both, both of these mean, mean the same uh, subset um, okay so if i were to look at let's say uh, first thing we, we will prove is that w1 is a subspace so let's say i'll consider two matrices a and b which belong to the uh, set w1 now i look at ca plus b as a matrix right where c is drawn again from this uh, field f right so this becomes um okay so uh, when you define this we need what a and b are so let's say so a therefore becomes something like this um x1 minus x1 y1 z1 and let's say b is um x2 minus x2 y2 and z2 right uh, and then what i do is i need to look at c a plus b right this equals to um you, you, you can verify this uh, so c c x1 plus x2 minus c x1 minus x2 c y1 plus y2 and c z1 plus z2 right now this belongs to w1 right because so what is w1 set by the way what are we saying is we are saying that the this element and this element the, 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 the elements of the first row should be negative of each other and remaining two can be any, any number so you can see here that this is actually of the same form these two elements are actually opposite or opposite sign of each other and these two can be any elements so therefore this belongs to w1 so therefore w1 is a subspace right this is proved same idea you can apply to prove that w2 is a subspace right so let's say again consider a b belongs to w2 um, a is let's say some a1 p1 minus a1 c1 b is a2 b2 minus a2 c2 and what i'm looking at is basically um, c a plus b which is equal to c a1 plus a2 uh, c b1 plus b2 minus c a1 minus a2 c c1 plus c2 right and this belongs to w2 because uh, the set w2 is basically such that the first column elements should be uh, negative of each other and uh, the second column can be any 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 numbers right so hence we have this uh, pattern here also i mean so therefore this belongs to the set w2 so, so the w2 is a subspace fine so you have proved that it is a subspace what we next need to prove uh, sorry what we need to find is the dimensions of w1 w2 w1 plus w2 and w1 interse intersection w2 so dimensions of w1 so um again the, the the idea of this elementary basis can can be very useful right so where, where you try to exp express each of the elements each of the elements of a matrix separately right and then look at you know how many uh, elements that basis has so w1 right w1 is a set of all such matrices which are of this form though right okay of this form so um i can look at um yeah so i can choose uh, the uh, basis right let's say for uh, b w1 i can choose a basis like this right okay, where i can say it is 1 minus 1 0 0 okay then 0 0 1 0 and then 0 0 0 1 right now why is that so if I were to, um, if I were to, <coughs> you know, uh, look at uh, any element here of W1, I can express it, express it as a linear combination of this particular set, right? Because I can say that this is now, uh, this, this general matrix is just, let's say I'll call this as um, A1, A2, A3, okay? So I can say that this X times A1 plus Y times A2 plus Z times A3. Right, where X, Y, Z are uh, elements of the field, and therefore this is, this is a well-defined product, uh, well-defined summation. Right, so hence, uh, so, so so this is true. So so, so spanning is uh, clear. Right, so this uh, set B W one spans the uh, uh, the subset W one, uh, uh, subspace W one. Other thing is that we we we, we do prove that, that this is uh, uh, that these vectors are are linearly independent. 
Now, same idea you can apply here. Uh, if I, I look at something like this, this gives me, uh, you know, this particular uh, form of a matrix. If I had to equate this to zero, right, this would imply that x equal to y equal to z all have to be zero, right? And hence, uh, a1, a2, a3 are independent also. Hence, they are independent, li linearly independent, right? So therefore, bw1 spans w1, right? So uh, in the same way, you can go ahead and prove that w2 has a has a basis. Let's say I'll call this bw2. Um, it'll have a basis uh, of uh, this form. So 1 minus 1, 0, 0. Uh, right? Huh. And then uh, 0, 0, 1, 0. And then 0, 0, 0, 1. Right? So any element of this uh, space W2, I can express it as a linear combination of these three elements. So go ahead and you know prove this. So prove that it is spanning, prove that it is, it is linearly independent and, and all of that. What we next need to look at is this set w1 plus w2 so what is w1 plus w2 mean right here plus actually means union uh, to be very clear so union w2 right so what are these elements in some sense right so uh, if you see um, so i'll have the uh, elements of both the form right i'll have uh, what do you call that uh, yeah so x minus x y z right this is one sort of set i have union a minus a b and c okay so this is the uh, set of uh, union of uh, the uh, these two sets right now uh, if you think about it what are we saying we're saying that um, so this thing tells you that whatever i choose in the first row first element it has to be negative of that but uh, so 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 uh, so uh, any element which is uh, I mean which, which comes about here, right, uh, starts belonging to B. Okay. So 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 we are try, trying to look at any uh, unifying sort of uh, example here. Okay. So what what we'll do is we'll consider a general matrix. Let's say I'm looking at a matrix um, uh, PQRS. Okay. If this has to belong to this uh, union W1 union W2 what would p q r and s have to satisfy right to belong to this union first thing is they all can't be exactly independent right so either okay so what will happen here either p has to be equal to minus q right or or p has to be equal to minus r okay either this or this has to happen okay so um, so um, what I will do is I'll say uh, I'll define a, a basis. Let's say I'll call this as um, W, okay, B W to B. So first thing is see S in any way is independent, so I can choose a matrix like this, right? So any element of this can can be you know uh, obtained from using this um, uh, this particular uh, uh, element, uh, this 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 vector, right? The second vector, the second thing that we need to look at is whether uh, how are P and Q related, how are P, Q, R, U, Q and R related. So if I choose um, uh, P as let's say uh, from, from 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 matrix in this way, so I will need uh, so I can either choose Q to be in this form, right, or I can choose this form, right. Um, Hopefully this covers all the elements though. Mm. Mm. Either this or this. Mm. And then And then I can choose uh, uh, an element which is goes like this. So I can say independent of P, um, I can choose Q, right? And independent of Q, I can uh, P, I can choose R, right? Okay, let's see if this is uh, linearly independent, first of all. Uh, very unlikely. Um, okay, so let's look at linear combination of this. What would happen is I will have um some so i have a b c d e so 
A here, B here, C here, D here, and E here. Yeah, this should be equal to zero. Doesn't necessarily mean all of these are zeros. Okay, so this basis will need require some thought process. W1 union W2 is it? Okay, I'll check this out and, and come back to you in the next class. The next uh, uh, thing that we have is, uh, let's say we have W of this form, that is W1 intersection W2. This is straightforward to understand because what will happen is you need the elements to to have both of these relations, right? So if I choose an element, let's say x, this has to be minus x from the from this relation, and it has to be minus x here also because it needs to satisfy the w2 elements also. The only element which is free is y, right? So therefore, uh, so for this, what I can do is I can choose a basis in this format, right? I can I can say uh, one minus one minus one zero and uh, zero 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 one. Right, so you're free to understand. So to see that this 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 uh, set is linearly independent and spans uh, W. Right, so any element here can be as a linear combination of these two vectors. Right, so hence you'll get that uh, the, the dimension of this thing is two. Right, so this thing is two, this thing is three, this thing is three, and. Uh, yeah, and this thing is uh, we'll, we'll we'll verify this and come back, right? So okay, so this is about um, this idea. Uh, next, coming to uh, next question uh, number nine is uh, okay. So we need to uh, so we have a vector space B over a field, subfield F of complex numbers. Suppose that alpha, beta, gamma are linearly independent vectors in B. Okay, so if they are linearly independent vectors in B, what what does it mean? So let's say I have A alpha plus B um, plus B beta plus Z gamma equal to zero implies um, that A, B, C are all zero, right? Now we need to prove that alpha plus beta, beta plus gamma and gamma plus delta are linearly independent. How would you go about pro proving this? Let's say I look at some uh, uh, combination alpha plus beta of these vectors. So E of E times beta plus gamma plus uh, F times gamma plus alpha equal to zero. Now I need to go ahead and prove that D, E and F will be equal to zero. But what is this equal to, right? So this implies that this is just um, alpha times D plus F, right? Plus, um, yeah, ah, yeah. So plus beta goes uh, D plus E right plus gamma gets um, e plus f right rearranging terms now we know that if this has to be uh, i mean this is uh, true right so what does this imply this implies that d plus f equals to d plus e equals to e plus f equals to zero this doesn't necessarily imply that all of these are zero by the way so we need to go ahead and prove that rigorously how you go about doing that is let's say you consider consider these as uh, uh, I mean equations in three variables, right? So then you can what what you can do is you can you can represent them as a matrix with uh, variables d, e, and f. So what you go about doing is you'll say okay this is one zero one 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 zero zero one one times d e f, right? Is equal to the zero vector. Is equal to the zero vector. Now this uh, will imply that d is equal to e f equal to zero uh, if this matrix i'll call this matrix as uh, let's say b if b is invertible right now go ahead and uh, feel free to check that b is invertible by checking its uh, determinant so determinant of b will not be equal to zero and hence we say, we say that d and e and f are zero if d and e and f are zero that means alpha plus beta beta plus gamma and gamma plus alpha are all linearly independent right so this is uh, this is the idea of the the ninth question. Uh, the last question in this we'll, we'll try to solve is this. Uh, let's say V is a set of all two cross two matrices A with complex entries. We satisfy this condition, right? So we're saying that V is a set of all 
two cost to matrices which are with complex entries so the elements of this particular uh, 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 you know v are complex matrices so we'll look at so v being a uh, sorry uh, yeah or uh, yeah so some let's say some matrix a in which belongs to this particular set v okay what that means is a is a uh, entry like this so a plus ib c plus id e plus if and g plus ih right but we are saying that this satisfies that a11 plus a12 a22 is equal to 0 so these two elements should be equal to 0 the addition of them so therefore a becomes equal to minus g and h becomes minus b so this gets basically minus a minus ib okay so we have this uh, sort of such matrices now we need to show that v is a vector space over the field of real numbers with the usual operation of vector matrix addition and multiplication of a matrix by a, by a scalar so um, yeah so to prove uh, uh, that v is a vector space over the field of real numbers right uh, we, we have these four properties right so first thing is that we need to prove that v comma matrix addition is abelian group right is abelian group and v comma dot has uh, some property satisfaction uh, uh, satisfaction one is identity property right and second is, is uh, compatibility and third is uh, the distributive property uh, which goes both ways that is dot is distributed over plus and plus over dot right so first we go about proving this v plus is abelian okay uh, so here what we do is we say okay um, we're trying to look at um, um, you know uh, so first thing we need to see whether plus is closure or not right uh, is plus closed on this sort of a, a matrix or not right so if i take any two matrices a and b right if i take a plus b what will end up happening is that um, um, let's say I, I i call the elements of a in this format right a11 a122 and so on so a11 a12 a21 and a22 right and this is b11 b12 b21 and b22 right this becomes equal to a11 plus b11 a12 plus b12 a21 plus b21 and a22 plus b22 right and this is because of the usual uh, you know operations of matrix addition so this is true from the matrix addition operation uh, now the thing is are these are the sums of these two that is your uh, the new diagonal entries are they are, are is that some zero or not and that is true right because a11 plus b11 plus a22 plus b22 is can be written as a11 plus a22 b11 plus b22 right and this is because uh, addition is commutative over complex numbers right so this is zero plus zero which is zero right so this is closed so if a so plus is uh, closed on uh, uh, these uh, this particular vector uh, space that is v right second thing is we mean prove is uh, uh so city properties a plus b plus c equals a plus b plus c so you know go ahead and prove this the straightforward uh, matrix addition operation and then the other thing is whether it's commutative or not as b a plus b is equal to b plus c again uh, sorry b plus um a right so which is also fine what we need mainly is the uh, identity element right so identity in this case uh, what we need is we need something uh, which says a plus e equals to a also equals to e plus a we, we want to find what is this e element as such right so uh, so e is also going to be a, a, a matrix in this particular set right so if a is for example a11 a12 a21 a22 right plus let's say i'll call this e11 e12 e21 and e22 right this is equal to the same matrix a11 a12 a21 a22 right by some algebra i can show that this particular matrix e11 e12 right is equal to a zero matrix right so hence Hence, what will happen is your your uh, e equal to the zero matrix two cross two. Uh, this is the anti element in this particular set, and the inverse. You know, the inverse is basically defined with uh, so there is uh, a plus let's say a inverse here is e. 
so here the a in inverse operation inverse is just the minus a uh, matrix right um, and this minus uh, okay so so by the way here we, we also need to see that whether this set whether this element e belongs to the set or not which is true because each of these elements are zero so e11 plus e22 is still zero so therefore e belongs to this set uh, v right and a inverse element a inverse ends up to happen ends up being something like this minus 2 1 minus 2 2 uh, so the uh, sum of diagonal elements that is minus a11 minus a a22 is just minus of a11 plus a22 which is minus 0 which is 0 so therefore this my a inverse also belongs to the set v and therefore inverse is also true so v plus is abelian this is true and second thing is uh, uh, looking at the properties of scalar multiplication right so uh, again uh, straight forward to prove that 1 2 a is a and uh, the um, property of commutative uh, uh, i mean the, the compatibility property which talks about c1 c2 times a is c1 dot c2 dot a right um yeah uh, so this ends up uh, uh, being a, a, a scalar multiplication of this and uh, so you, you can see that, that this holds and the next thing that, that, uh, that we need to check is uh, c times a plus b is c times a plus c times b and c1 plus c2 times a is c1 times a plus c2 times right so all of this will hold from the ideas of matrix multiplication uh, i think special about you know having this sort of a condition on this matrix right um, what we next need is we, we want to find a basis for this vector space okay here is where we need a bit more careful uh, thought process so basis for this uh, so to, to to define what a, uh, to, to recall what a basis is is that uh, any linear combination of the uh, basis elements should basically span the whole whole vector space now we know the vector space can be expressed in this format that is a plus i b c plus i d g plus i h minus a minus i b right uh, the linear combination when you take of any elements in the basis the the, the scalars that you use are actually your uh, real numbers right because what are we saying here we're saying that this is a field over the real numbers right all of these elements here c1 c2 c so all of these uh, you know uh, c's here are actually uh, belonging to the real number space so here also when you're taking the linear combination that can only give you real numbers right so to get these um, to get these uh, um, uh, imaginary elements in this particular uh, set what we need is we need uh, this uh, uh, the the uh, elements of of the basis to have this uh, imaginary part in them inbuilt them uh, in them right so so what we do is uh, let's consider a basis of this format let's say a1 i consider it to be uh, 1 0 0 minus 1 a2 to be um, you know i 0 0 minus i right a3 to be element 0 0 uh, 1 0 okay um, a4 0 0 one second uh, yeah. 0 i 0 0 a5 to be 0 0 1 0 and a6 to be 0 0 i 0 right so uh, First, first check that all of these elements are a part of the vector space uh, which is defined in this format right which, which, which basically has a condition that the diagonal sum should be zero right so here also the sum is zero sum is zero and these are all zero elements so these are all zero so all of we know that all of these a's that we have defined all belong to the vector space which is one step good next is we need to see whether this spans this, this particular vector space uh, v or not right so let's see if I have any matrix of this format, I can actually uh, represent any A as um, A A1, right, plus B A2, plus C A3, plus D A4, plus E, sorry, not E, uh, G, why oh, I am using G here, uh, 
what have we used till now? We have used um, e, e, right? So let's just stick to that notation. Uh, yeah, E plus I H. So E times A5 and uh, H times A6, right? Because this summation, uh, this uh, summation is, is well defined because your H, uh, all of these A, B, C, D, E and H are uh, are your um, uh, real numbers, right? So you can multiply them with your matrix in this format. Uh, and then look at this uh, basis right so this will turn out to be uh, this matrix a plus ib and so on right so therefore uh, these this particular set a1 to a6 it spans your vector space v and it's easy to see that if, if this is set to zero right uh, if you want all of this to be set to uh, uh, this combination to, to be equal to zero what will end up happening if uh, so if a is um, zero this would imply that a b c d e and f all will turn out to be zero and therefore they are linearly independent right so hence uh, this forms a basis for this particular uh, set uh, this vector space b right so just be real careful of what the field is defined over right so in case it was complex numbers uh, we could have made it a bit more easier on us and say that okay a plus ib is one complex number and i can just use that one basis because the field is defined over the real numbers, your basis uh, elements as such need to handle the case of um, complex numbers uh, because the uh, field can only give you real numbers, right? So hence we need this sort of a thing. So if it is uh, defined over a field of real numbers, you need six bases to define this uh, six uh, elements uh, to, to define your vector space uh, completely. Uh, and in case if it was, uh, you know, uh, the uh, thought was to use uh, complex numbers then you could have done something more uh, you know sophisticated okay that's the um, idea okay uh, so in case if you wanted complex numbers we, we could actually just uh, represent the i mean let's take a deviation here if the field was complex numbers right uh, what you could do is you can represent it to be some like z1 z2 z3 and minus z1 right where z1 uh, 0 z3 z4 are uh, all these are complex numbers so therefore I, I just need three basis elements i just need a1 to be equal to uh, you know 1 0 0 minus 1 um, a2 to be something like 0 1 0 0 and a3 to be something like 0 0 1 0 right and all of these satisfy the condition that your diagonals are diagonal sum is zero so all of these belong to the set uh, v right and since i can choose this the uh, field is complex numbers i can represent any of this um, any matrix in this format as you know z1 times a1 plus z2 times a2 plus z3 times a3 right uh, and uh, i'm going to equate to zero what will end up happening is uh, you uh, uh, since all these elements have to be zero uh, your z1 z2 z3 will, will also be zero and therefore they, they become linearly independent right so this is the this is the basis when you have the field defined over complex numbers right and this is the basis when you when you have the field defined over uh, reals right so be very careful what the field is defined over that will define that will basically uh, influence the number of basis vectors you require to explain i mean to span your vector space okay um <clears throat> fine so with this we'll close the idea here uh, i'll get this uh, union thing done uh, clearly over a while um ideally six elements won't be useful uh, i think you just need four or four should be sufficient if i'm not wrong um right <coughs> okay um we'll come back to that uh, then let's come to um so coordinates we, we, we discussed a bit and uh, you know uh, this, uh, i think much to be done here the idea is that uh, you basically define an order on your basis right alpha 1 to alpha for example we have a set we now define it as an ordered set in some sense and then look at the uh, coefficients which uh, which multiply those respective basis um, uh, you know elements to give us the uh, vector in the vector space that a set of uh, the the ordered pairs of your coordinates would then become the uh, sorry the, the, the ordered uh, uh, ordered uh, uh, you know tab list of your um, um, scalars then becomes the coordinate of that particular vector under that given basis and since we can have in, uh, since uh, uh, any vector space can have any number of basis uh, any number of basis we then uh, saw you know how to go from one basis to another 
right uh, if we saw like we just need to multiply uh, the given basis uh, given coordinate which is just an, just an element of fn uh, with a matrix in fn cross n uh, and you will get the uh, new new um, uh, you know uh, coordinates uh, of the same vector under a new basis right and all of this becomes very uh, uh, simple uh, i mean because applicable we are trying to look at cartesian and polar coordinates right because when you are trying to look at um, something like xy uh, uh, coordinates to something like an r theta sort of coordinates and inverse uh, mapping of these two right uh, so, 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 so basically if you can represent the uh, basis the, 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 the standard basis um, uh, you know vectors of your Cartesian coordinate in this polar coordinate system you can always go back and forth between these two uh, you know uh, uh, coordinate systems okay Fine. So this completes the vector. This completes the vector spaces part of the uh, lecture. Uh, so all theorems, everything has been done. I mean, important things have been have been completed from this uh, part of the lecture. We'll now go and uh, go ahead and, and do some problems on the linear transformations uh, part of the uh, part of the course. Okay. Uh, so one thing that was pending in uh, so okay. So some recap on linear transformations um, is that we saw that uh, so uh, basically it's a function uh, uh, between two vector spaces v and w. Uh, and, and we say it's a linear transformation if this condition holds that is if t of c alpha plus beta is c times t alpha plus t of beta where c is any scalar in f alpha and beta are any vectors in the uh, domain of t right uh, and one thing to understand is that uh, c alpha plus beta here is an element in the vector space v when you apply t which is a function on going from v to w this gives an element in w and same thing happens here right so hence uh, this c uh, the, the field basically need, needs to be common over both the vector spaces v and w otherwise this this product is not well defined right so you need that c to be uh, the same uh, uh, same field uh, i mean both vector spaces should be defined over the same field f okay um we saw one example that you know uh, differentiation as a uh, as a linear operator uh, linear transformation uh, between uh, you know on the set that uh, set v which is basically the set of all polynomial functions is a is a linear transformation right um, we also uh, said that you know the uh, integration operation defined in this format can also be a linear transformation so we'll just do that um, uh, now and see you know how how that uh, works out okay um, so um, sorry yeah um, yeah, so we'll look at uh, integration as a uh, linear transformation on the set of functions. Uh, so, so we have v is a functions r to r that are continuous. Now we already know that this v is a, a vector space, right? Um, and we're saying that t f of x is also is is a transformation which takes uh, functions from v to v. Okay, so we're saying that um, t is a transformation which takes from v to v, right? Um, um, okay, uh, so so we are looking at this this transformation t f of x uh, as a uh, is it a linear transformation or not, right? So to prove that, we need to first understand um, the 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 um, uh, the function c f plus g, right? Okay, so let's say I have f comma g which belong to this set V, right? Which also means that f and g both are r to r by definition of v and f and g are continuous over this space right so cf plus g function is defined in this format right we say that is equal to cf of x plus g of x right now uh, i'm looking at the t applied on this function so t on cf plus uh, g okay uh, is it is it equal to c times t of f plus t of g now um yeah so uh, t of c f plus uh, g of x if i were to look at what would does what would this mean this is basically integration zero to x this function that is c f plus g over t dt right now this is equal to integral zero to x by definition of this function uh, c f uh, uh, 
uh, cf plus g you get this right now integration is um, linear i mean uh, uh, when you have uh, sum of two uh, functions integration you can actually put them inside i mean you can take the integration inside so you get this to be equal to c times 0 to x f of t dt plus 0 to x g of t dt right this is basically t of f of x and this is t of g of x right by definition now this is true because the properties of integration integration over continuous functions okay okay so this so therefore uh, so, so so this holds for all x so therefore you can just write t times c uh, t applied on cf plus g is c of t of f plus t of g okay so therefore this uh, t defined in this format the, the uh, integration of from 0 to x of any function f is a uh, linear transformation on this uh, on this vector space the vector space defined uh, is here a uh, set of functions which are which go from r to r and which are continuous in nature okay fine so this is um, one example that we looked at so we see the like uh, functions as uh, as vectors is very uh, you know uh, applicable like we, we have a lot of operations on this on this functions set which can be looked at uh, looked at as a vector space in, in, in itself um, yeah we then looked at um, matrix multiplication as a linear transformation uh, and then uh, yeah so we, we said we said that if we have a linear transformation then t of 0 is equal to 0 right and then we have this um, yeah uh, we then prove that uh, for any ordered basis for b and let's say uh, w is the uh, codomain of uh, t right and if i have any n distinct vectors of this particular uh, sorry any n vectors of this w i there's a unique transformation which takes these um, elements alphas to your betas here right and we proved the uniqueness and we proved that it is a linear uh, in nature okay and we so you know how how this becomes important when we uh, you know look at going from higher to lower dimensions and so on we then proved uh, looked at two important subspaces of uh, any tra linear transformation which, which is called the range and the null space the range is basically a subspace of the codomain that we have that is w and uh, the null space is basically a subspace of the domain that we have which is v in this case we proved that it is a subspace uh, we then define what is rank and nullity of a transformation that is uh, basically the, the dimensionality of the uh, range of t is called rank the dimensionality of the null space of t is called nullity uh, we, so we, we then have to prove this theorem called as rank nullity theorem which says that uh, so, so suppose v is fi finite dimensional that is uh, let's say some dim which, which is equal to n then that is equal to the rank of the transformation t and the nullity of t so we'll go ahead and prove that today and then we'll look at some problems in this um, linear uh, transformations uh, uh, part of the lecture okay uh, okay so we'll start with this idea that uh, let dim v equal to n right this uh, basically it's finite in nature right which is a finite uh, number uh, so now uh, let's say we have the nullity of t is equal to m so if nullity of t is equal to m that means i have some m vectors which span this basis uh, which are the basis for uh, you know this uh, space n of t that's a null space of t right so i'll, I'll call this set as uh, this basis set as s now s is uh, a linearly independent subset of v right which is very clear because these are these are vectors in v and they form basis so they, they are linearly independent and it's a subset of v which is fine now we know that from the previous uh, lecture we saw that if we have a linearly independent subset of any vector space i can always extend it to become a basis okay so uh, so let's say i i extend that and i find some, some more some more vectors which span now the uh, ve uh, vector space v right uh, so, okay so, so we have this se which is a set of all these um, vectors v1 to vm and some new vectors v m1 to vn and this se is now the basis for v right and see we said that uh, the uh, dimensionality of uh, v is n so i can have at max vn 
number of uh, uh, vectors in this set. So hence I am I'm, I'm getting all these vectors Vm1 plus 2, uh, Vm plus 1 to Vn. So my total number of vectors in this particular set Se can be at max n which is uh, what we are uh, honoring in the in this case. Okay, now uh, my claim is that uh, for any uh, and for any of these vectors Vm plus 1 to Vn uh, the transformation applied on this vector uh, t of v j will not will ne will never be equal to zero, right? Uh, for any j more than m, right? And that is true because uh, if not, what would happen is uh, if t of v j is equal to m, then v j belongs to uh, the null space of t by definition of null spaces, right? Which would mean that then your uh, then I can express v j as the uh, linear combination of some uh, of these vectors vm to v, v v1 to vm right if this was not the case so if this happened i can express vj as some linear combination of uh, i equal to 1 to m right if that happens then your v1 to vn set this se will not be linearly independent right but that uh, which is not true because we have said that se is a basis it, uh, basis by definition is linearly independent right so therefore this is true okay so therefore this is true fine with this we'll now move on to so 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 so, so basically now i have this set s bar uh, s dash defined like this I'll, I'll say i'll apply all this um, you know transformation upon all these vectors tm1 plus 2 tn and form this set s bar right now the point to notice any or any element of s bar is not s dash is not zero right any element of s dash is not a zero so therefore there is a possibility there is a possibility that s dash is linearly independent right because we saw that uh, if a set contains the zero vector it is for sure linearly dependent now we now with this we know that any element a will not be zero so therefore th there's some possibility that s dash can be linearly independent and that becomes important going forward because what claim i want to make is that i'm saying that s dash is a basis for r of t right for the range of t okay so um, so so to prove basis we need two things one is linearly linear independence and other thing is spanning right so first we'll prove for <laughs> linear independence so uh, let's say that they are not linearly independent right what would that mean? It would mean that there is some uh, scalar C M one plus two C N, uh, which belongs to this field F, such that the linear combination of these vectors, which is these vectors, the transformed vectors, is zero, uh, uh, so, and, and also such that there is at least one uh, the J, such that all of the C J is non-zero. Right? There is some J where the C J is not zero, where J is again uh, uh, greater than M. Right, uh, so uh, yeah, so so so, so the, <laughs> this is by definition of linear dependence. So once that happens, I can write this as T of uh, all of these, right? Because this is by definition of linear transformations, right? Linear transformations. So this becomes uh, the uh, transformation applied on this particular vector, which is the uh, combination of this one. Now, uh, what would this mean? This means that. Uh, your this vector c m one plus two v m plus v n would belong to the null set uh, 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 the uh, null space of uh, transformation t right because uh, by definition of null space of t now this is going to be a contradiction right why because we said that uh, if this belongs to uh, the the null space then I can express this as any uh, uh, as a combination of these vectors v one to v m but we said that these are not uh, we, 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 we cannot express any of these vectors as as a linear combination of v1 to vm and therefore it's a contradiction and therefore we can say that s s dash is linearly independent okay so we have proved one part of it we have said that the transformed vectors of v1 vm plus 1 to vn are linearly independent of each other then we need to prove spanning spanning basically means that if i take any linear combination of these uh, uh, sorry if I take all possible in a combination of these, I should get back the uh, range of t. So we'll look at this. So let's say uh, I, I define w s dash as a subspace spanned by s dash. Okay. 
so let w be a some vector in, in r of t right then uh, by definition of this uh, range what does it mean it means that there is there exists some vector v such that t of v is w right this is by definition of r of t right by the definition of r of t now when that happens now since s e is a basis for v right we we already discussed that previously so what that means it means that uh, there exists some c1 to cn where i can express this v which is a a uh, vector in this vector space v as a linear combination of all these elements uh, of se right so c1 v1 up to cn vn now what i will do is i i, I i'll apply this transformation t on this uh, on both the sides what i will get is t of v which is w okay i just applying t on both the sides right so t of v which is t of uh, because w and t of all of this just becomes uh, c times their respective vectors uh, right because of the uh, uh, definition of linear transformation right linear transformation definition right now uh, we know that t t of v1 to t of vm right t of v1 to t of vm all of these will be actually equal to 0 right because v1 to vm are all parts of a are the elements belonging to null null space of t null space of t by definition means that t of uh, of that vector is going to be zero so all of those elements turn out to be zero the only non zero elements that, that remain is going to be cm plus 1 to cn right so therefore we have sh shown that any vector right any vector which is in the range of uh, t can be expressed as a linear combination of the uh, elements of s dash right s dash is the uh, set of all these uh, transformed vectors so therefore we say that any vector can be is in the combination of s dash and therefore s dash spans r of t if s dash spans r of t right uh, and s dash is, is basically a, a linear combination uh, sorry linearly independent uh, set therefore uh, uh, s dash is a basis is a basis for r of t and if it's a basis for r of t the, the 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 dimensionality of r of t is just going to be the number of elements in s dash which is n minus m so the rank of t is basically n minus uh, m and uh, so what is n n is the dimensionality of v m is the nullity of t and the and the rank of t is n minus m so therefore dim of uh, the dimensionality of v is equal to rank plus nullity right so this is the famous rank nullity theorem right this becomes very important when you're trying to look for uh, i mean the, when you move to matrices where we where we see you know how to uh, how does this affect the null space and column space of uh, matrices uh, and 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 their respective orthogonal say, orthogonal spaces okay so this is the uh, proof of rank related theorem um again we, 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 we haven't done anything fancy here it is all just using the definitions of linear independence and the idea that uh, you know uh, what does it mean for a for a vector to belong to one of these spaces that is either the either the null space or the uh, you know the the, the range uh, of of a transformation t okay fine <coughs> this is the rank uh, nullity theorem uh, we'll do some problems on this uh, uh, linear transformations and then uh, we'll look at algebra of transformations okay um, yeah um, so first thing we want to look at is for the following functions t so we have some functions t going from r square to r square right if you see here it's taking two elements that is r x1 x2 which is element in r square and it's spitting out two elements 1 plus x1 comma x2 similarly with uh, uh, the second question b uh, are these linear transformations or not so very simple to prove linear transformations what we need to prove is we need to prove something like this c alpha plus beta is is it, is it equal to c times t of alpha plus t of beta right this is what we need to prove for both of these so consider the uh, a uh, question right so first define what is alpha let's say i'll, I'll define alpha as um, alpha 1 and alpha 2 uh, beta as beta 1 beta 2 uh, what is c alpha plus beta is basically c alpha 1 plus beta 1 comma c alpha 2 plus beta 2 
right? This, uh, all of this we have covered under the idea of, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Fn space, right? So when we looked at Fn as a, as a vector space, right? So how do you define uh, addition operation in in this uh, in this vector space? How, how do you define scalar multiplication as an operation in this vector space? So all of that is uh, covered under that. So therefore, you get this uh, this particular uh, you know uh, 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 combination is well defined, which is in this format. Now what you need to look at is look at t of c alpha plus beta, right? Which is basically t of c alpha one plus beta one, comma c alpha two plus beta two this is equal to uh, by definition of this transform linear transformation is basically 1 plus c alpha 1 plus beta 1 so what are the first coordinate is there I'm, I'm adding 1 to that that's that's the first uh, uh, coordinate in the uh, uh, range of t and the second coordinate is as it is so it is c alpha 2 plus beta 2 right so this is the result of applying t on this okay now we'll look at what is um, what is uh, C T of alpha plus C T of beta. So C T of alpha plus T of beta, right? So C uh, T of alpha is basically uh, one plus alpha one comma alpha two, right? Uh, plus this is uh, beta. Sorry, this is um, one plus beta one comma beta two, right? So this becomes basically uh, you'll have C plus C alpha one plus 1 plus beta 1 comma c alpha 2 plus beta 2 right now uh, very clearly these two are not equal right so this is not a linear transformation right so see it may seem very very simple here that you know we're just adding one number here and addition are generally linear transformation is not that way we need to look at uh, this sort of a rigorous approach to you know go ahead and prove that these things are linear transformations or not okay um, second question here is defining t of x1 comma x2 as x2 comma x1 so it's just reversing the uh, coordinates in in some sense right so um, okay so in the same way if i define alpha 1 alpha alpha and beta and all of these actually let's do this uh, i'll put a here yeah so alpha beta are defined here so t of c alpha plus beta okay is now going to be c alpha 2 plus beta 2 comma c alpha 1 plus beta 1 right now what i need is i need to look at um, c t of alpha plus t of beta c times t of alpha is going to be alpha 2 comma alpha alpha 2 comma alpha 1 plus t of beta is beta 2 comma beta 1 right so this becomes c alpha 2 plus beta 2 plus c alpha 1 plus beta 1 sorry uh, plus, um, yeah right uh, is this uh, correct so c alpha 2 plus beta 2 c alpha 1 plus beta 1 yeah okay so as you can again uh, see uh, okay yeah. so th these two are equal good so these two are equal so therefore uh, this is a linear transformation fine so in, in this way you can go ahead and prove uh, such uh, these things now let's look at uh, uh, a more general a more applicable extra example uh, so describe the range and the null space for the differentiation transformation uh, example 2 is basically what we did uh, in the beginning and the integration transformation for example 5 same same thing here so range of the differentiation transformation okay so this example 2 that we had I mean this was the example that, that the book is referring to where we have um, uh, yeah this thing uh, right this one so let me just take uh, yeah move this let's see I don't know if it works Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is what we had. Uh, we had a field of um, we had a, we had a field f. We have a set v, which is a set of all polynomial functions from f to f, uh, and f of x was defined to be 
uh, something like this we have a function uh, d and we said that this d is indeed a is, is indeed a uh, linear transformation right d is a linear transformation now what we need to see, uh, see is uh, what is the range and the null space so how to define range of a transformation is basically all those uh, vectors <coughs> all those vectors which i can i mean uh, yeah so which i can uh, reach from t so alpha belonging to v such that t of uh, yeah uh, beta belonging to v right where t of alpha is beta uh, for there is some alpha which 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 for which this is true right that is the um, idea okay and now r of t is this um, now yeah, r of t is this um, what we need now is uh, yeah so we, we want to define uh, what sort of functions right uh, would this r of t contain right and again very simple sort of a uh, idea here right so if i have a function f which is defined in this way uh, again the 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 definition itself is like this which is basically c1 plus 2 c2 x and so on up till n c n x power n minus 1 right so therefore uh, r of t is basically all polynomials all polynomials of degree n minus 1 right because uh, any polynomial i can take uh, I can, I can always generate uh, this this sort of a uh, this sort of a uh, co uh, coordinate for it right i mean the the the, the um, uh, yeah the, the scalar for it uh, and and therefore uh, uh, that can be reachable through this transformation that there is a d transformation on such a polynomial uh, f right on, on such a polynomial f right now okay so, so that is the range of this uh, range of this um, uh, uh, d operator right uh, second thing is we, we want to look at the null space of uh, this transformation right w what does it uh, mean it uh, so null space of any transformation is defined as alpha belonging to uh, v such that t of alpha is zero right so we're saying that your sorry um, yeah so such that um, the differentiation of this of any function d f of x right uh, should be equal to zero what would that mean it, it would mean that i mean uh, yeah it would mean that this polynomial should be equal to zero right so this polynomial to be equal to zero and, and we already saw that uh, the, it should be true for all possible x right so which means that all this c1 c2 cn uh, should be zero is the only possibility that means c1 c2 until cn should be equal to zero um uh, in 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 the function f so therefore what sort of functions will have uh, this this sort of a uh, uh, representation it's always function which are constant so f of x equal to c naught right mm -hmm. so all the functions which are of this form that is f of x equal to c naught when you apply the transformation that is d transformation the, the uh, 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 to to differentiate you would get the resultant uh, uh, of this uh, of this transformation to be the zero uh, polynomial right so therefore the null space of this uh, operation d is basically uh, functions of the form f of x equal to some scalar uh, some scalar c naught okay this is the uh, null space of uh, d okay fine uh, so uh, with this idea uh, okay so we now will look at uh, now we'll look at uh, the integration example uh, again what was the integration example i was just did today uh, yeah here we go so we said that um, okay. yeah. Uh, um, So uh, we have this, uh, uh, you know, function. Uh, we give the transformation t f of x, which are all continuous in, in some sense, right? Um, so uh, the the uh, the the range of t, 
right range of t is just going to be all the functions which are reachable in this format right so uh, which when applied um, the, the the transformation t uh, i can get it in this format so uh, that is actually just going to be the function which are which are again continuous in some sense so let's just uh, think about it a bit um, so a range of t is basically um, so sorry So um, you know uh, beta belonging to uh, the space uh, V, right? Where T of alpha is equal to beta. There exists some alpha for this. This happens, right? So uh, the thing is, any uh, any uh, function, right? Any function uh, which is continuous in nature, right? Because al alphas, so alphas basically here are um, continuous functions. Right, continuous functions. So when you integrate a continuous function, you, you, you I, I can get a continuous function, right? So any continuous function, if you were to, uh, you know, uh, uh, apply this uh, uh, transformation t upon, you will again get a continuous function. So this is all again the set of continuous functions, right? So we, we, we aren't assuming any special form here, like how we did the uh, in the differentiation case. We, we looked at just the polynomial sort of functions here uh, you were saying that it's all possible uh, you know uh, continuous function so therefore this is the uh, uh, range of the t transformation now uh, what we need to look at is the null space of t null space of t basically tells you that uh, alpha belong to v such that t of alpha is zero now the thing is um, um, you want a function right such that uh, t f right t of a, t f is a zero vector this is the the, the the zero function right now this uh, what will happen is um, when you look at the uh, that is t f of x which is defined as zero to x f of t dt this should be equal to zero right and this should happen for all x right because we're, we're talking about functions as elements themselves right it should happen for all x now uh, uh, one case is when x is zero by itself when x is zero what will happen is your um, is that your um, uh, what do you call that uh, the the, uh, the 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 area under the curve becomes zero so so, so, so therefore the the uh, integral becomes zero right but the thing is it, it should happen for all x and see f is any continuous function right so even the most basic continuous function which is for example let's say f of t is equal to some constant say some some constant c naught uh, you still have some uh area under the curve right so the, the so the only function for, for which this will be true is the zero function that is f of x equal to zero right so therefore the null space of t is just going to be the zero function which is a zero vector right so here this which is uh, special uh, the the special subspace called a zero subspace right so the uh, n of t in this case it, 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 it is the zero vector uh, uh, which is defined here right um, okay uh, okay so that's the idea of your uh, second question uh, the 13th question here for example uh, so what are they saying they're saying that let v be a vector space and these are in, in, tra transmission from from v into v mm, so t goes from v to v prove the following are equivalent so uh, when i say equivalent we need to prove that uh, a implies b and b implies a that is a if and only if b so when a if, and only b, if b then it's called a and b are equivalent and and that basically means that uh, they imply each other okay so the intersection of the of the range of t and the null space of t is a zero subspace of b uh, the second statement is if t of t alpha is zero then t alpha is zero okay so uh, okay so we will first go ahead with proving a implies b what are we saying we're saying that the range of the intersection of range of t and the null space of t is zero a subspace of b so this is given that is a if a if a happens we need to prove that b is true okay um so the uh, range of null range of t in the null space of t is the zero subspace okay so r of t intersection n of t is 
is the zero subspace that is um, is equal to zero right uh, what that means is uh, the only element which is common among uh, uh, the range and the null space is the zero vector okay so uh, what is range of t defined as we say that this is basically um, any uh, vector right this is basically any vector um, let's say beta okay uh, in v such that t of alpha is beta right t of alpha is beta there is some alpha which for which this is true and null of t is basically alphas belonging to v such that t of v is so t of alpha is zero right now see since v is uh, since, since t is defined from v to v uh, you can take intersections okay see because range of t is uh, is a, is a is a subspace of the domain of codomain of t and null space of t is the subspace of the domain of t now here since both are the same vector space intersection of these subspaces is well defined uh, is is well defined right it exists in some sense so th so this is the um, meaning right um, okay so uh, we are saying that okay if this happens then this needs to happen okay okay so so uh, what we have is we're saying that t t of alpha is zero okay so let's take t alpha let's take t alpha as some beta okay and t beta is zero now what is beta then beta belongs to the range of t right because t alpha is beta so beta, beta is reachable from uh, uh, beta oh what happened okay it's working fine uh, Oh, it, it didn't sync only it seems like okay okay fine. yeah okay uh, so what you're trying to prove is uh, where were we here uh, yeah so we have defined what i mean we, we, we have just written what range and null space means we're saying that okay th that the intersection of these two is the zero subspace and if uh, so so this is true uh, sorry if, if this is true we, we need to prove that, that this is true in this again we have a if condition so therefore again we need to assume that this is true so let's say we're saying that t t of alpha is zero uh, let's consider t alpha as some beta okay uh, and what we're saying we're saying that t beta is zero now if t alpha is uh, beta what does uh, it means it means beta is a part of the range of t right by definition of uh, range of t and if t beta is zero what does what does it mean it means that beta is uh, you know n, n of t so so uh, belongs to n of t so beta belongs to both range of t and the null space of t that, which basically means beta has to be the zero vector uh, beta has to be zero right because we we assume that condition here right the, the, the intersection of the range of t and the null space of t is zero if beta is zero what is beta by the way t alpha so t alpha is zero right so this is so a implies b is proved now we need to prove the other way around we need to say that b implies a right so b implies a we need to prove what are we saying uh, we're saying that okay uh, so if b is true that means this is happening that is uh, t t alpha is zero then t alpha is zero okay if this happens if this is true then we need to prove that the range of uh, intersection is the zero subspace of b okay um fine so um what are we saying here is um let's say let's say that uh, i have a vector beta which belongs to the range of uh, t okay um, um okay and uh, let's say i have uh, so so what does it mean it it means that there is some alpha uh, such that t alpha is beta okay t alpha is beta now let's say beta belongs to a null space of t also right which oh, it means that uh, t of uh, beta is zero uh, this we know is basically i mean what is beta t alpha so t of t alpha is a zero now since this is true it means that t alpha is zero which means that beta is zero right so the only vector which can belong to both of these uh, spaces our uh, range of t and the null space of t is a zero vector right hence prove that uh, hence prove the uh, b implies a condition also right so this is the way you can solve this uh, sort of a problem right okay uh, so we're almost to the end okay uh, so we'll do the uh, we'll do some uh, one part of this uh, algebra of transformations and then probably we'll look at uh, problems in the next uh, lecture okay so uh, algebra of transformations we we saw first you know how do you define addition of two 
you know uh, two transform two two linear transformations and 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 how you could also define a scalar multiplication of a linear transformation and and when and you define it in in this way you you you, you look at uh, you, you you can actually define uh, the set of all li linear transformations from b to w as a vector space over f again right so which shows the powerful uh, the, the the power of this vector space idea where you define that where you define transformations themselves as a vector space over the field f right and it proved you know how how it could be a vector space and so on uh, and, and 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 we also define what is a, a composition of two linear transformations and, and it pro proved that uh, uh, the composition composition is is also a linear transformation uh, we then define what is a linear operator which is just a special sort of uh, thing uh, where the where the operator where the transformation transformations uh, domain and codomain are the same uh, so hence uh, it's called a linear operator on the vector space v we then define what is uh, meant by invertibility that is uh, in case we have a, a transformation p uh, so we, we say it is invertible if if there is, exists some other transformation u which goes from the codomain to domain of t um, uh, such that the compositions themselves are identity or uh, identity uh, operations uh, identity transformations uh, on the respective uh, domains right uh, we, 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 we proved that you know uh, if you need such to happen that right, if it is invertible then it's going to be one one and uh, on two and, and and the fact that that the inverse inverse is unique right um, we, we then came to something called as a non-singular linear transformation and we had a proof pending here so yeah so what we said that uh, what we said was that if there exists a, 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 I mean uh, the the null space of the transform of the of the linear transformation is, is a zero vector then we say that the uh, 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 the the transformation is, is a non singular linear transformation right that is if t so, so t gamma equal to zero implies that gamma equal to zero that, that is for no other vector in v can t gamma be zero the only for the zero vector it is zero right um okay so we uh, we uh, will prove the uh by directionality once again so we'll see that okay so so we, uh, we have a claim here that uh, if t is one one then t is singular and the other way around if t is non-singular so t is non-singular then t is one one okay so if t is one one it, it's very clear we, we already saw that if al so, so so what is one one mean that if alpha one is not equal to alpha two right uh, then t of alpha one is not equal to t of alpha two right so uh, if the uh, input elements are different then, then the output that is the uh, uh, the mapping of that uh, of the uh, elements under the transformation t are also not equal so uh, so hence what i can say is if alpha one is not equal to zero then t of alpha one will not be equal to zero because t of zero is always zero right so uh, so this is uh, let's say something like a bar implies b bar so hence uh, uh, so so uh, this implications contrapositive is going to be b implies a which is basic uh, which, which means that t of uh, alpha uh, alpha 1 equal to 0 implies that alpha 1 is 0 so hence which is your uh, uh, the, the other way around it is proving if it is 1 1 then t is non singular right so let's say it's called a b so a implies b is uh, proven from here right uh, now we need to prove b implies a that is if t is non singular right if t is non-singular we need to prove that t is 1 1 now uh, so if t is non-singular we, we can say that you know uh, t gamma equal to 0 implies gamma equal to 0 and what is uh, so so we need to prove that t is 1 1 so let's assume uh, what is t is 1 1 conditions right that yeah that um, t of um, alpha uh, 1 um, sorry yeah so we'll assume uh, so we'll, we'll 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 assume the opposite of t one one that is t is not one one so that means there exist some alpha one and alpha two which are not equal but t of alpha one equals to t of alpha two right right there exists some alpha one alpha two which are uh, for which this thing happens so if this ha if this happens then t is not one one and, and we'll see that we'll we'll come to a we'll come to a uh, contradiction now when this is true. Can I write t of alpha one minus t of alpha two equal to zero, right? Because I, I, I'm just uh, adding the additive inverse of uh, t of alpha two 
on both the sides right which is well defined now this can be written as t of alpha 1 minus alpha 2 equals to 0 right why because from the property of linear transformations but by, by definition in some sense right now this implies see from from, from the thing that t is non-singular this implies that if t of any vector is 0 that means alpha 1 that means this vector has to be 0 so alpha 1 minus alpha 2 is 0 right which then implies right which then implies that alpha 1 is equal to alpha 2 right and which uh, and we came to a contradiction so our assumption that t is not 1 1 right so uh, so we assume t is not 1 1 right is false and therefore t is 1 1 right so therefore t is 1 1 and uh, hence so so we prove b implies a and therefore uh, we say that so if t is 1 1 and uh, t is non-singular are basically equivalent definitions of uh, non-singular linear transformations okay this is fine uh, we then had two important theorems uh, in this uh, idea of um, you know uh, algebra of transformations so let's look at those two right now um, yeah um, so uh, one theorem that we have is uh, let's say we have a transformation t which goes from v to w uh, if t is non-singular if and only if it t carries each linearly independent subset of v onto a linearly independent subset of w we uh, we actually went through what this statement means that is let's say t is non-singular so, th so that means that the null space of t is just a zero vector um, if this happens this is equal to saying that if I have a linearly independent subset of V, that is alpha 1 to alpha n, right? Then if I apply T on each of these elements, uh, the resulting subset, uh, the, the resulting set do, that I get, that is T of alpha 1 to T of alpha n, is also going to be a linearly independent subset of W, right? Because these are elements of W. Uh, so it, it, it's going to be a linearly independent subset of W. Okay. So, uh, we'll do the uh, forward case first, that is, let's say this is A and this is B, okay? We'll prove first that um, a, a, a implies B first, and then we'll go ahead with B implies A, okay? So, if A implies B, then that means, uh, suppose that T is non-singular, right? And, and I'm, I'm calling this set S as uh, S alpha 1 to alpha and B, a linearly independent subset of V, and I'm calling this S dash, the subset, um, the, the, the set of vectors which I get by applying transformation t on each of these elements alpha 1 to alpha n there is t alpha 1 to t alpha n um, now we're saying it since t is non-singular right therefore t is 1 1 we just proved it just now which means that t alpha 1 to t alpha n are all distinct okay this is um, fine right so uh, so so there's some hope that it is it, it, going to be uh, linearly independent right because if any one of those vectors would have repeated then very uh, then it's very clear it, 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 it would have been a linearly dependent subset now uh, so okay so so so, so we we'll now assume that s dash is not linearly independent so uh, what does that mean it means that i can write uh, 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 you know uh, some some linear combination that is c1 t of alpha 1 to c n t of alpha n to be zero such that there exists some c uh, uh, for for some c i where uh, where c uh, uh, where, where, where it's not equal to zero right now uh, this is basically equal to t of c1 alpha 1 to cn alpha n right from the definition of linear uh, transformations this means that c1 alpha 1 to cn alpha n is zero why because we have assumed that uh, 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 we, 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 we know that t is non singular right t is non singular so this means that s is linearly dependent right because we have found a set of scalars c1 to cn such that not all of them are zero such that uh, the uh, uh, combination is uh, giving you the, 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 the zero vector. But we have already assumed that S has to be a linearly independent subset. So, which is a contradiction. So, therefore, uh, A implies B is proved. Right? Now, we look at B implies A sort of a condition. That is, we are saying that uh, T carries each linearly independent subset of B into a linearly independent subset of W. Okay. So, now let's say, I have uh, t of alpha is zero, where alpha is non-zero, where alpha is non-zero, right? Um, now I know that s is equal s is equal to alpha is linearly independent. Why is this? Because of the fact that uh, since I have just one 
uh, vector which is non zero uh, any combination i take here i will never get a zero vector right so basically the, the idea is any c such that c alpha is zero is not true right for all c right so therefore uh, alpha by itself is is a linearly independent uh, uh, subset this s is a linearly independent subset now which means that s dash which is obtained by applying uh, t on this is going to be linearly independent right because that's the assumption we have made so because t carries any linearly independent subset of v into a linearly independent subset of w so s dash has to be a linearly independent subset but what is t of alpha t of alpha we, we have said to be zero so that, so that means uh, so the zero vector has to be linearly independent which is not true because zero is linearly dependent so this is a contradiction so hence we have proved that uh, you know your uh, uh, this t cannot have any element like this uh, i mean t cannot behave like this which means t is non singular right and hence we have proved that uh, b implies a is also true so hence this uh, idea is true right so if t carries um, uh, so if t is non singular then will then t will carry any uh, uh, independent subset to uh, uh, the subset in w and vice versa right okay now with this uh, we'll do the uh, last theorem uh, okay so let v and w be finite dimensional uh, vector spaces such that the, the dimensions are equal that is dim b is equal to dim w so if t is going from uh, v to w is a linear transformation following an equivalent that is t is invertible t is non singular and t is on to so now to prove the so so we are saying that all of this are equivalent that means one should double imply two should double imply three and so on right so what we will do is we'll we'll prove it in a cyclic manner we'll say that one implies two two implies three and three implies one right and then obviously uh, it can go back to all the things so so we imply that one we said that one implies two and two will imply one because two implies three and three implies one so therefore two implies one so this will become true. Now two implies three we have proved. We, we need to prove that three implies two. So since three implies one and one implies two, so three will also imply two, right? So if you prove it in this manner, we are we are still fine. So we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll go ahead and use this approach here. So we're saying that okay, first thing what we need to look at is we need to look that if t is invertible, is t non-singular, right? So we know that by by the definition of uh, uh, the uh, invertibility and and, and all the way to, defined in this section is so, so that if t is invertible t is one one and we already seen that if t is one one then t is non-singular by def, uh, uh, both, both both is an equivalent so one one implies two is fine then two should imply three that is if t is non-singular then t should be on two okay we'll see what is that so if t is non-singular that means the uh, the null space of t has only the zero vector which means the the nullity of t is zero which means the rank of t is equal to n. Why is this? From the rank nullity theorem. Right? Rank nullity theorem. Right? Where, where n is the dimension of uh, v and w, whatever you want, right? Um, since both are equal, right? So now we, we are seeing that the, the dimension of rank of t is equal to the dimension of uh, the uh, w, right? And we know that the uh, 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 the um, range of t is is a subspace of w right that means that um, r of t i mean the, the, the subspace basically uh, will sp uh, will span uh, the uh, actual uh, space that is w hence we can say that r of t is basically equal to w and hence t is onto right because t onto meaning uh, means that the range should be equal to the codomain and therefore that is t is onto okay this is from the uh, ideas that we discussed in the subspaces uh, sorry yeah, the basis and dimensions uh, uh, part, right? Okay, so this is the uh, idea of subspaces and dimensions that we discussed before. Now we need to prove three implies one. That is, if t is on two, is t invertible or not? That's that's the other question that we have under this condition that dim v is equal to dim w. Okay, yeah. So if uh, uh, so yeah so if, if t is on two, what does it mean? It means again as we know that r of t equals to w. Um, uh, so therefore rank of t is equal to n right because this is basically your uh, dim w which is equal to dim n dim v right if rank of t is n then nullity of t is equal to zero from the rank nullity theorem rt sorry rn theorem 
right? Um, yeah. Uh, then with this, what we have uh, is that uh, so if the nullity is zero, that means the the, the only uh, subspace, uh, the, the only uh, 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 vector space which can have dimension zero is the is the uh, null space. So therefore, the n of t is zero. If n of t is zero, that means t is non-singular, and it means that t is one one, right? So now what we have proved, we have proved that if t is on two, it is it is one one also under this condition that dim v is equal to dim dim w. Okay. Now with this, what we can say is that for every beta in w, there exists a unique alpha in v such that t of alpha is beta. See, for every beta in w, uh, uh, t of alpha is equal to beta is true from the fact that it's an onto function. It's onto t is onto. Uniqueness comes from the fact that it is one one. Okay. If it is unique, now I can always define a transformation T inverse, which goes from W to, w to V such that T inverse of beta is alpha. Right? Because uh, the, uh, yeah, so, 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 so what does this mean? This means I have a proper pairing for every beta, there is only one alpha. So, uh, uh, so, 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 so I can define a transformation which takes me from beta to alpha which is t inverse in this case. So now we'll look at uh, the composition of this t inverse and t in this format. So t, t inverse of beta is t of alpha because t inverse of beta is defined as alpha. t of alpha is beta. So therefore t, t inverse is uh, the identity. And then t inverse of t alpha is t inverse of beta because t of alpha is beta. And then t inverse of uh, beta is alpha. So therefore you get again alpha. So which is, uh, so therefore this is also uh, identity and therefore we say that t is invertible, right? So t is, T being on to implied that T is one one and that implied that T is invertible under the condition that the dimensions are equal. So therefore, uh, all of this is proved. So one implies two, two implies three, three implies one, and therefore all are equivalent. So when you have uh, uh, the dimensions equivalent between V and W, right? Then either of these are all fine. I mean, if if uh, if T is invertible, then you can say T is non-singular and on to and all vice versa. Right. Okay. So we'll stop here, um, and uh, we'll meet in the next class. That's on Friday, uh, where we'll discuss uh, some problems on this uh, chapter. Uh, this this part of the lecture, algebra of transformations, some simple problems, and then we'll look at these ideas of isomorphism and representation of transformation by matrices. Um, we'll see if time remains. We'll do some problems on on eigenvalues and on on, on eigenvalues and stuff. Uh, right. Uh, once that is done, the last lecture, which will be on 2nd October, uh, same timing around 10 or 11, uh, this one, um, okay. So, uh, we will tie all of these concepts with matrices, right, in terms of vector spaces, linear transformations, eigenvalues and everything in terms of matrices, okay. Uh, okay, so see you guys on um, Friday, 10 a.m., all right.